All right, welcome everybody back to the philosophy of art and science. And we use that word philosophy, which means wisdom, love a lot, but today we really mean it. We're joined by our special guest today, Dr. Wan Yung Kim, who's got her philosophy doctorate in philosophy. Even the PhD normally stands for doctor of philosophy. It's funny, but this is actually in the field of philosophy. And we have a, a, a few a few things in in common, but that are maybe different sides of the same coin that I think I'll I'll say in advance to to set it up for her. She is into Catholicism. And as my listeners would know, I'm in Orthodox Christianity. And if you know anything about Orthodox Christianity and Catholicism, on the scale of low church to high church, these are two of the highest church institutions that that trace themselves back to the work of uh, Jesus and the apostles, of course. She's currently getting her JD in addition to the philosophy, which philosophy was my undergraduate study work. I never took it to, to such a high level, but I'm, I'm glad to be able to learn from her today. And I got my, my master's in dispute resolution rather than going for the JD. So there are illusions there. We have the term leftist, which in some way she identifies with, and I as well I identify. And then she's also a translator or an interpreter, which I've done, but I'm guessing we do different languages. So wel welcome to the program. And did I pronounce your name right? Tell me if I'm pronouncing it right. Um, it's Wan Young. Wan Young. But, uh, it's totally OK. People pronounce it different ways. And, so, uh, so that's a good uh, entry into like, um, I don't know if you ever do transliteration in addition to translating, but I'll give you one example. My family's from Ethiopia and my own name, Henok, there are about four different ways that people write it when they're transliterating it into the Latin alphabet that uh, English uses. A name like Wan Young, do, do people have different ways? Like do some people spell it with two O's or with uh, just U's or do, do they spell it differently in English or has it become standardized? Um. There's generally only been one way that I've spelled it, but people misspell it with a G in the middle, like... Oh, like Carl Jung. Yeah, or, so I don't, I don't really know. Um, yeah, I think it's like a, a, it's a, it's like a German thing, like uh, Johann, Johannes Bach, I think is with like a J. Um, Carl Jung is with a J. I think it might be a German thing. That's funny. It may it may even be a, a Scandinavian thing. Okay, that's cool. So there are, as I've listed them, a million topics that I that I think would be interesting. Since we started with this one, can you tell us a little bit about your translation work and and what languages you're actually working with? Uh, yeah. So that's something I actually did up until two years ago before I decided to go to law school, but I was. Um, translating Spanish, Spanish, German, French, and Korean. Amazing. And I got, <laughs> got to work in different languages. Like, okay, so it's not like I have like the full, the whole dictionary of vocabulary that I need to know. Like in my mind, I was able to consult a dictionary, mm -hmm. but I was able to, um, one second, let me, let me close the door. No worries. Um, so I was able to work in these languages just because I had a, a good grasp of the grammar. Mm -hmm. And um, I did, well, some of the translations I did was very, were very like, um, they're very simple, like bank statements, but they're very confidential. And uh, I translated leases and other legal documents. Yeah, that no, I so the vast majority of interpretation or translation work I've done is Amharic to English, which is the language of Ethiopia, and English to Amharic. I definitely don't do French or German, although those are really cool. And you know, being the forefathers and foremother of English, I'd love to get to know them better. Spanish, I have a, a working kind of minimum proficiency with. And even where I had to do some of the legal documents you're talking about in Spanish, it would be rough. I, I used to be a mediator in the courts of Los Angeles. And during that time, when there were not, as there normally are, plenty of native Spanish speakers, 
my boss at the time, she, she knew I could speak a little bit. So she would throw me in the fire and I would do kind of verbal translation and interpretation. And like you said, it's like the same subject matter each time. So you're more familiar with it. And I was, I was able to, to even get some legal documents done in English in Spanish, but I will say sometimes it was like Spanglish, you know, sometimes it's like they're working with me knowing that this was like a, a free service present pro provided to them by the County. And like the alternative is to go into a courtroom and, and, uh, you know, fight it out in terms of a lawsuit. So, uh, I think. I appreciate your humility in it, but even running to the dictionary is no, no easy task. That means that you, you have some base level of proficiency even to be able to, to filter through uh, a dictionary like that. Was, was there a particular one of Korean, Spanish, French, or German that, that got you more excited or they're all equal level to you? Um, so Korean is my native language because both my parents are Korean, but uh, for some reason, I, I really enjoyed French and Spanish mm -hmm. and um, other than doing like this legal and medical translations, I um, actually translated a philosophy book um, oh. by Alain Badiou, uh, these seminars on Nietzsche and uh, that was in French. So that's fascinating, translating the works on a German philosopher from French to English or to, to what language? Yes, French to English. Yeah, that's that's interesting. And and so you did most of these were, were written documents. Did you ever have to do the, the verbal stuff in, in any of the no, languages? No, not at all. Yeah, that's interesting. Is it easier? Do you feel it's easier it's or easier is it just to do, I guess it kind of feels like you're put on the spot when you have to do live translations. Mm -hmm. And you don't really have the opportunity to mess up or to check your work. So I'm glad I've never had to do that, but uh, I might, I might have to, I might have to do Spanish when I become a lawyer. So. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. You know, that's, that's very interesting because I always found the verbal stuff easier, but only because it was like more non-committal it seemed to, to allow more fluidity when i did written texts i would almost get analysis paralysis in terms of like what word to do you know i almost want to like put like five synonyms for every word because i never feel that it's you know like i'm never comfortable this might be the perfectionist coming out like i'm never comfortable with whatever the final product was of the one to one translation so that that's cool though that you did so many of those in in writing and so that's a that's a natural segue since you were discussing Nietzsche. Now I did my undergraduate studies in in philosophy and I like to think I'm I'm able to follow a little bit. But I, I saw that you came out with your own book. It's titled Cosmo Phenomenology: The Alterity and Harmony of Consciousness as Dark Energy. I gotta say, try as I best. Maybe I just have to purchase the book and read it all to understand. I <laughs> didn't even know what it was particularly about. Although I'm, you know, from reading the bio a little bit, I imagine you know it's something of of the thought of of Nietzsche and and thus a little bit of the the thought of nihilism. I don't know if it follows his work on Thus Spoke uh, Zarathustra or or which one of his his works it follows. What's your book about? Okay, so um, I do mention Nietzsche, but it's kind of like a tangent. So the book is primarily about an approach to phenomenology that um, this a Danish theologian named K.E. Lostrup came up with. And it, it looks at non-human aspects of nature and nature as a whole, rather than just the standpoint of human beings. So this is where um, I was able to integrate phenomenology with, with the viewpoint of, uh, well, integrate it with quantum physics. So there's, there's that classical, classic problem of why a wave changes to a particle when someone is observing it. And that's tied to consciousness. And I was trying to examine that problem 
And then um, I was also looking at near death experiences. Like uh, uh -huh. there are thousands of people who say that they have experienced some kind of afterlife, like heaven or God, um, when they've been and they come back. And then yeah, they come, and they come back. back. Yeah, like their brain is completely dead, but they're able to have some kind of mental activity. So that begs the question, can consciousness survive outside the body? And all, a bunch of religions say that, but um, I was just trying to uh, go into the theory of some guys named Hamroff and Penrose. Um, Penrose is a mathematician and Hamroff is an anesthesiologist. And they say that, um, Consciousness is the quantum activity inside these little structures called microtubules. And then when you die, that information is, is, is still quantum information, so it survives. So I was comparing that to Leibniz's monads. Because Leibniz says that the world is constructed of these small psycho, psychophysical particles that are indestructible. Yeah, so he, he, was one of, he was one of those. Leibniz, I've actually read some of the other authors. Nietzsche, of all of the ones you mentioned, Nietzsche and Leibniz are the only ones I have read. But the physics portion is interesting because my my last philosophy of religion paper incorporated the study of of cosmology for I think some of the same reasons as you. I think that's a point that other people don't understand. A lot of philosophy papers that I had come across were normally just humanity space, but yours and, and you know, they'll call themselves interdisciplinary, but your book seems to be from, from how you're presenting it, like genuinely interdisciplinary across STEM and humanities are the resources that you're drawing from. I think some people don't realize that some of the physics, whether it's quantum physics or the cosmology delves into things that you know, are rightly called philosophy, which is like yes. another side side part of the larger conversation that all of these things used to be housed in philosophy if you go back, you know, far enough into the to the the past anyway. So that that that's interesting. Um the the basic substances of the world, the the monads that that Leibniz called they're still in the universe, right? They're still in, in space time. Were some yes. of the thinkers you're encountering saying that the consciousness that leaves the body is is still in space time, is still in the universe? Or were they saying that it was, you know, in another in another universe that that you know we might have to get to through a wormhole or or just like in a I don't even know how to describe it, like outside of universes or the multiverse? Well, that, that's the question. So I leave that kind of open. Like it could be in the same universe. It could be in a, an alternate universe. And uh, we don't really know. Um, <laughs> but I do talk about that theory. And uh, and, and it, it does seem seem like it's possible that it could be an alternate dimension even. Um, so those are all questions to think about. That's great. That's great. And obviously, we're not going to talk about every every aspect. Uh, it's in there. Everyone's going to have to go read the book to find out, including me. So that that's very fascinating. I think an an underlying thesis, right? The 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 two big theories for those who don't know in cosmology, the two camps. I think the majority camp is the the quantum physics camp that that you studied. Uh, the older camp used to begin from a Catholic priest, which was the, you know, the very loftily titled Big Bang Theory. And the Big Bang Theory and this have two main differences, but even atheists, you know, like Bertrand Russell used to believe in, in the Big Bang Theory, even though he would just say that it was a, a brute fact that the universe came into being at some time out, out of nothing. Whereas some of the, the quantum folks believe that there was no past that the past was infinite that was actually more of the, the the subject of my last philosophical work as an as an undergrad and i'm wondering how your your phd work aligned with the catholicism were, were you into catholicism at the time or is it a more recent and you know how, how do the those the world view how, how does the world view of catholicism um, mesh with or it, be in tension with any of the, the philosophical work that you were doing? 
So um, I actually grew up Protestant. Like, um, so mention my parents are South Korean and on my mother's side, my great grandmother was uh, converted to um, Methodist Protestantism by wow. some missionaries. And so my grandmother was a deacon and choir director in a large Methodist church in South Korea. And um, my mom was also a deacon at a at some Presbyterian church here in the oh U.S. My God. I'm, and, I'm a uh, deacon, by the way, in case you didn't know. So that's really funny oh, wow. to me. That's very <laughs> like that's incredible. <laughs> yeah, and then um, I I I was involved in like the worship team, so I played music in church, uh, mm -hmm. piano and cello. No, piano, cello, guitar, singing, and then. Um, I don't know. It's something about the the ancient ancient traditions of the mass. Uh, I had I had some mystical experiences during Catholic mass after my brother converted to Catholicism, wow. and I just felt so connected to the Catholic community and to God. And I found the tradition of praying to saints and to angels, very interesting. So that's why I I just became Catholic, actually. I converted uh, in May. So. Wow, <laughs> well, fresh. I, I, had, I had a friend recently convert um, to, he was a, a catechumen or he was studying orthodoxy, but he, he ended up choosing Catholicism. He's a black American. And uh, he he liked the the universality that he saw in the Catholic Church, and ultimately the the organic Black Catholic movements in the United States. Sometimes uh, in high church culture, we call some of the experiences you're talking about the smells and and the bells, right? The the, yeah. the priesthood, the the incense. From what I understand of of the Methodist, as well as you know, I've, I've had a number of Korean friends and. I grew up in in Taekwondo, so at least when I was a kid, I used to be able to to count in Korean. I've probably forgotten all of that by now. But from what I understand, it it seems at least higher church than most of the evangelical Protestants that I encounter in in the United States. Were were there such thing? I mean, you, you, even you're talking about like deacons. Not every church has deacons anymore. You know, some of them just have a pastor. So you you had deacons in the church you grew up. Did you have things like incense? Was there a special way of of dressing? Did, did you all follow the the church calendar, things like that? Um, like Advent a, and Lent. No, not at all. Those things were all things I associated with Catholicism. Like we just had Easter. Yeah. And we didn't even have like uh, like Good Friday or. Uh, the days leading up to Easter or Lent at all. So, um, so all the tradition, all the all the celebrations and uh, all the traditional like uh, dates that the Catholic and uh, Orthodox uh, churches follow. Um, I think it, it leads to a greater sense of community and uh, a more integrated lifestyle. So. Yeah, yeah, you're you're not only preaching to the choir, you're preaching to the clergy. I'm I'm with you there. That that's a a beautiful thing to to hear, and I didn't realize it was so recent. I thought it might be recent, but I didn't realize it would be um, so recent. It's good that that you came to this uh, realization. But it's an interesting thing you say about about community, because um, was it your great grandmother? That's pretty that's pretty deep. So from your great grandmother to now, your family had had been Methodist. If you don't want to get into it, we don't have to. But is there is there tension between the new community you're forming and and the community that you you came out of? Like, or I mean, you said your brother was there, kind of like you're John the Baptist. He cleaned the road for you to go there. But wh what does everyone else think about you and your brother converting to Catholicism? Um, my mother is still like a, a pretty devout Protestant. Christian, so I don't know. She doesn't have a negative opinion, mm -hmm. but she 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 doesn't really uh, comment much on it. And my father is like non-religious, like I think he's agnostic. Mm -hmm. So 
he didn't really have an opinion either. He just thought, oh, it's good for you if you find a community. That's neutral. You know, it's it's one thing for, I, I appreciate agnosticism and what I say is a true sense of agnosticism. This goes back to, to philosophy a little bit. I've come across two main types of agnostics. The one agnostic says, I don't know and nobody can know. And I, I get offended by those. And I, I think that the, those statements are, are self-reflexively absurd, you know, because you say, how do you know that nobody can know, you know, and it, it stops there. But the real, some of the most humble people I've, I've encountered are the agnostics. And, and I think my parents are that, you know, to an extent who they're not like in the new school of atheism. They just say, I don't know. And, and they leave it at that. You know, it's like whenever you begin to philosophize further than saying, you know, the simple statement, I don't know, it, it delves into territory that that really lets the the hearer know well you're claiming to know something so the fact that that your fam's been supportive no, nobody's been questioning your salvation they're like oh she's not saved anymore nobody says that that's i know some of the the comment uh protestant language you know i've, I've even see that in in some of the vitriol between ethiopian protestants and ethiopian uh, orthodox which is kind of the, the main divide but no, nobody's questioned your salvation no not at all well I haven't, uh, I haven't really gone back to the Protestant churches and told them that I became Catholic. But uh, um, I wouldn't really say there's been like people challenging it. And uh, no, it's, it's, it's been a good transition. That's wonderful. That's honestly wonderful news, and I'm I'm excited to see. Because you you also say you have a, a background in the worship team, right? In in the music, yeah. are any of those skills transferable now? Like in doing the response of the mass, you know, do you stick out? Is is there such thing as a as a choir or any any sort of cantor like positions that that you'd ever consider? Um. Not well, okay. There's like there's some cantors at the church at the at at the place that I've been going to, but um at one of the masses that I attended with my brother, there was a uh, a girl singing and singing during one of the masses, and I think there was some kind of either guitar or some kind of stringed in instruments being played. So I do think there is some kind of role at some other churches. Okay, but but not particularly. And, you know, are you, for example, because it seems like you have a, a love of languages like I do, are you, are you always going to an English service or are you tratting it up with some Latin or are you going to any Spanish services? Oh, I, I, would, I would like to attend a Latin service, like, I don't know very much Latin, although I could learn. But you mainly Spanish and French. You have your Spanish and French as a base. <laughs> yeah, but it's just been English services so far. Yeah, I wasn't. I wasn't sure when you when you mentioned some of the 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 ritual nature that that stuck out to you. I know sometimes like the intonations, the singing and the chanting, it, some of it is lost in translation. Right. So sometimes you know. Um, for, for Ethiopia, the ancient language, the liturgical language is Giz, and we translate into Amharic, which is our vernacular, as, as well as English. And when we translate our mass into those languages, usually we just read something, you know, like stand up for prayer, Lord have mercy on us, things like that. Whereas when it's in the, in the, la the, the older languages, it's really more, more sung, like the pitch is there and and all of the the kind of musical beauty. So that that's why I was wondering if it was it was more like incense or the vestments or you know the the kind of seriousness of communion. Yeah, communion is is definitely more serious because of the transubstantiation, like believing that it actually turns into Jesus's flesh. And I heard there have been miracles where um, the bread has actually turned into some kind of human flesh. Like, it's very odd. And they do scientific experiments on it. And it seems to resemble, like, flesh from 
someone's heart, the heart of someone who's in under a lot of distress. So it, it's like Jesus's actual flesh from when he was being crucified. Yeah, it was and... it was the early Christians saying this that that had their pagan and polytheistic counterparts, you know, saying these people are cannibals and they're incestual. You know, they they marry people they call their brothers and sisters in Christ, <laughs> and uh, they're they're eating their they're eating their master. You know, this is one of the great cultic um, table turns, right? All the the classic yeah. art, the ancient cultic practices. The deity is saying, sacrifice, you know, your virgins and all your innocence into this volcano on my behalf. And uh, here we are eating our own deity. Yeah. <laughs> that's cool. That no, that that's cool. So so I imagine you're doing it more frequently now than you than you did even a year ago. Um yeah, so I attended a, a Protestant. Uh, a Protestant church that was um, that had that had um, they had communion every week. Oh, that's which great! Is not common. Yeah, yeah, that's rare. I I almost know none like that. Yeah. So, and I've actually only been attending certain special private masses. Oh. Okay. And so it's actually been less regular from when I was a Protestant. That's kind of funny. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But you have the option every time and, and, but it sounds like you have the option every time there. See, I knew some, some people who go to church who would say like once a month or once a year is when they take communion. So that level of frequency that, that was a Methodist church that was doing it every week. Uh, I no, they're Presbyterian. Presbyterian. And, yeah. 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 They're they're also relatively high church as well. It, it's more like the Pentecostal and and other like Bethel movement, other charismatic groups that I think put less emphasis on the communion. But yeah, Presbyterian, Lutheran, Episcopalian, Methodist, Anglican, I think tend to to put more emphasis on the communion. So so that's great. Could could you tell us then after after all of this uh, all of these various studies? How you still had brain power left to continue and pursue your your juris doctor? Well, so honestly, it's actually kind of a little exhausting and stressful. <laughs> like um, in in grad school, when I was studying philosophy, I was able to decide what kind of thinkers I could focus on and whose whose works I read and write papers on things that interested me. And now in law school, it's like a set curriculum. And I guess, of course, there are electives. Um, I, I'm just right now a second year law student. So nice. I am deciding the courses yeah. that I'm taking. Yeah. Although there are like bar tested core subjects like family law or criminal procedure or civil procedure. But um, it's a lot more stressful in law school. <laughs> So I'm honestly eager to get school out of the way as soon as possible. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Is is there a specialization? I heard you mention criminal law as well as family law. Is there a certain specialization or a, a you know a type of practice that you see yourself getting into? Um, well, to be honest, I really like environmental law and um, labor and employment law. So I'll be deciding between one of those, or maybe even both. Like I'll I'll definitely take both courses and see if I can get a job in one of them or both of them. If there's a law firm that somehow does both, <laughs> so that that's exciting. His Holiness Pope Francis, I, he he doesn't get a, a lot of love in trad circles, but one of the things I appreciate about him is that he's put this emphasis on the environment you know you know you in your protestant background you would have known this as well it's like we're we're stewards of the earth we don't really own anything god is is the owner of, of space time multiverse whatever whatever it is that we got here we're dealing with so the fact that you want to be a guardian or a steward of that and, and take care of that while still, you know, maintaining your religious beliefs, it's like it's like almost, um, you know, people 
seem to be more godless into the environment, you know, where, where they want to put people, put animals, you know, before human beings. And, and it's rare that you, that you see someone, you know, who's, who's still into their, their piety and their religious beliefs, but from that conviction wants to take care of the earth. So if you go the environmental route, like that, that's a beautiful avenue that I think a lot of people interested in, in church are, are not getting into. And if you go to labor and, and disputes, that's, um, that's big. <laughs> that's a big industry. I could tell you, at least from the Los Angeles market in meet in terms of mediation, that's the highest paying of all the, the industries. I had, I had mediators from that field come in and I remember, you know, and this was a flex, but this was like in 2015 was when I graduated, they had speakers come and tell us like, you know, they were, they were charging in LA, like up to $8,000 a day in the Bay area in New York, like 12, $15,000 a day for all of these things, whether it's around like, you know, civil rights law or, or disability. I'm, I'm imagining because you, you put it, you know, in contradistinction with the environment is, is it, not so much, you know, the money aspect or like, it sounds like you, you have some sort of uh, indignation or righteous anger and in, in defending people that are more marginalized or, or powerless. Is that, is that a fair assessment or what would be the motivation there? Yeah, I, I want to be like a radical leftist lawyer <laughs> and I guess it would be nice to make lots of money doing that, but that's not necessarily the main goal. Um, and right now I'm actually trying to decide between taking the Michigan and California bar exams. Uh -huh. um, and in Michigan though, like obviously there's not much opportunity for big, bigger, uh, big law or people like, uh, most lawyers work in medium to small, smaller law firms. Mm -hmm. And I am trying to decide if, I would like doing that or I want bigger opportunities. So. <laughs> yeah. For like one of the big law firms in, in one of the big cosmopolitan areas. Yeah. Yeah. My, my, my cousin, he just uh, finished and passed the, the Cali bar and he's, he's working, you know, for one of the big real estate firms here in, in Los Angeles. So I, I know that route, you know, the idea of working big first and then you could always go back. That'll be interesting. You have, I mean, you have time, right? You have a, you have a, a couple of years to decide. It's, it's, that is interesting though. And, and you brought up one of the, the words, I think political words, the definitions, labels, um, this goes more into philosophy of language. They, they are best as conversation starters than conversation closers because leftist lawyer could mean, I think so many things, even the word leftist means so many things to, to so many people. I know you were a part of the, the other life event where Curtis Yarvin, who I got to, to have a conversation with on Ethiopian history of all things, um, was live here in, in LA. I'm, I'm mad that I missed it a few, a few months ago, but I would love to hear, you know, what would interest you in a speaker like Curtis Yarvin, who, you know, I think himself and others would place kind of squarely on the right or as, as right wing. And, and maybe that's an abusive language. Maybe the language is an issue versus someone like the former president, Barack Obama, who I think by majority opinion was a leftist as well as a constitutional lawyer. Um, or, or even let's say if not Obama, someone like, like RBG, like Ruth Bader Ginsburg, right? The Supreme court justice is considered both a leftist and you know, beyond a lawyer, she's she's got to the highest level of of jurisprudence. Uh, she's in SCOTUS in the United States. So, is do you when you say leftist, do you mean it differently in in a, than a way that people would understand Ruth Bader Ginsburg or Barack Obama? And uh, no, not a, maybe maybe a little bit more more radical. Like like uh, there are people who call Obama a war criminal. Yes. <laughs> because of all the innocent children that he's killed. So I would, I would agree. I'm, I'm right there with you. I, you know, one of my favorite docs that uh, documentaries I just recommended to people is citizen four. I don't know if you saw that one with uh, Laura Poitras, Glenn Greenwald doing this, this um, 
you know, deep interview of Edward Snowden, right? Who persecuted uh, this whistleblower when he said he was going to have great policy for whistleblower, but Obama, right? Um, so, so that's interesting. So, so what do you think of that? Like that there's a strain of people who identify, self-identify as leftist, but would call Obama a war criminal. But then he would, I probably, if you ask him, identify as at least progressive, if not a leftist and other people, you know, would, would call him, you know, maybe pejoratively a leftist. What, what do you think about like, well, that, I that think label? The, people, the people calling him a leftist are definitely on the right or, uh, some form of conservative. And I think it's more accurate to call him a progressive. So you would not identify with the label progressive? Like for you, leftist is is contrary to that? Because I think a lot of people, again, a lot of people could be wrong. Maybe they're using these labels incorrectly. But I think a lot of I, people would, would use those as synonyms. I, I personally think actually that progressives are a little bit more moderate or closer to the middle than they are to the left. And uh, like Joe Biden would also, okay, so he's kind of kind of a little bit more complex, but still <laughs> still be somewhat of a progressive, although he has like a he has a track record of supporting segregation and voting against women's rights. And um, and he said some things that can be construed as being racist. <laughs> <laughs> can be construed as I, I hear you've 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 learned legalese already as well. <laughs> yeah, it was very safe, very safe. I like that you didn't outright condemn. So so that's interesting. So going back to how you said there are conservatives who would pejoratively refer to someone like Barack Obama as a leftist. I'm with you. I would refer to people like Obama and, and, and Biden as progressives. And I tend to think of myself more etymologically and historically as a, as a liberal, as, as Bastiat and Proudhon, who literally sat on the left during the French Revolution. At, at the same time, to, to, take, to extend your analysis, I think the people who you know, identify this way, would, who identify as progressives, would typically refer to Biden and Clinton and Obama as the liberals. And they use the term liberal pejoratively to, to mean yeah. like, like what you're saying, like, like a moderate. Yeah. yeah. So, what, what do you, so what do you make of the, the muck of uh, you know, all, <laughs> all the different ways people, people use these terms? And then I guess, how would you, you know, identify s s someone like Curtis Yarvin, who, who maybe you are potentially interested in, in at least hearing out for devil's advocate's sake or, or for, for something? So uh, Curtis Yarvin told us about how, I guess he had, he had communist grandparents and he actually made fun of them, but he told us how he support he he voted for Obama and he supports Bernie Sanders even though he's obviously yep. on the right. And he says he's obligated to vote for Joe Biden as well. Yeah, so to me that actually comes across as being somewhat centrist in 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 um, in behavior or in in practice. So. Um, I, I don't know. We, we had some very, okay. So his talk was, was somewhat enlightening. He talked about some history and a lot of world war two, but, uh, we actually took, there are a number of people who tripped on, who microdosed on acid mm -hmm. back at the mansion where everyone was staying. And, and he, he was really going like apocalyptic at the party. <laughs> he was he was really talking about how the coronavirus was like going to be some kind of catastrophe. And he was talking about how he had stocked up on three months of food back home. I think he lives in Northern California. So mm -hmm. yeah, and uh, 
And I was surprised that he had children. Like I didn't really <laughs> imagine him to be someone who was who was married or had children. But uh, we went to the basement, no, not the base mansion, but to the Alamo, which was the hall where he was talking. He drove us there and there were like kids, soccer gears and a soccer ball and kids stuff in the car. And uh, yeah, we just, it was interesting to, to get to know him as a person. Yeah, no, that, that's fascinating. I think what you're referring to in terms of apocalyptic is the idea that people might uh, support the same candidate for very different reasons. From what I understand, you know, it's more of an accelerationist position, right? Is the idea that the system is going to crash and the only way to get to a better state than the status quo is to not slow the collapse, to allow it to happen. And I think the, the argument goes that some of these uh, allegedly you know, conservative politicians, what they might do is just slow down what is already going to happen. You know, Michael Malice was famous for putting it this way, although I think he got the idea from Curtis in the first place that there is no substantial difference between conservatism and progressivism, that per, um, conservatism is just progressivism driving the speed limit. And so that, you know, the conservatism of 2020 is really the progressivism of the 90s and, you know, and so on and so forth as, as you look through the the decades. But but that's, that's interesting the way you look at it is as long as you're, you end up choosing the, the same people, then it, then it's not a, a big difference. So uh, is there someone, cause to me of the political parties, it's not the Democrats that usually have the most leftist in the, in the way that you and I would, would mean that term. It's typically the green party. Like I have uh, Nassim Nicholas Taleb's book, Skin in the Game. And in the beginning, he dedicates the book both to Ron Paul and to Ralph Nader. And, you know, Ralph Nader is the one of the most famous leftists, as the way you and I are describing it of all time, who who ran in, in the Green Party. Did, did you ever look into the Green Party as, as something that you identify with? Or do, do you think there's any difference between them and, and Democrats? I know sometimes people say some elections are too big to, uh, to be ideological like that. So... I think I think people people who support who, who are aligned with the Green Party and people who are Democrats can find some equal footing, especially if obviously they believe in climate change and mm -hmm. are trying to prevent that through a number of policies. And I never I never actually looked into the Green Party very much, but I knew someone who who very staunchly supported them and was actually trying to run, like he was looking at like running for office himself. <laughs> so I knew a little bit about that, but personally I never got into it. Okay. It sounds cool though. You had like a friend run in the party. Not everybody has that. Yeah, it was, he was, he was, he was interested in, uh, somewhat of a grassroots level and uh, and was attending like uh, these lectures that uh, allowed just about anybody to run for office if they wanted to. Well, that that's awesome. And I hope if if anything, you know, whether we're in the midst of the apocalypse and not noting, not noticing it or, you know, there's a, a greater apocalypse to come, I hope more and more people are, you know, thinking critically and 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 being Renaissance women like like you <laughs> in all of these categories, whether it's you know interpretation, religion, philosophy, or or the law. And I really appreciate you giving me my time today. Obviously, I'm going to plug your your book when we throw this up on YouTube. Are there any other projects or any other things you want folks to to look at or or look out for? Um. So I've had my head deep into law school, like an ostrich burying its head in the sand. <laughs> but um, I'm about to, I'm, 
I'm about to work on something more in phenomenology with a friend of mine who is a, who is a Christian and a Buddhist at the same time. And I think we're just going to write a few articles for some literary magazines. So um, I'll post more about it uh, once we have something finalized. That's good. No, that's a good, that's a, that's a good promo. Thank you so much.